Many of the greatest leaps in architecture have been made by builders of churches. Think flying buttresses of Notre Dame. Think the dome over St. Peter's. But you don't have to look to medieval Europe. You can also look to modern day California. Orange County, 1955. Surfboards, bikinis, and cars. Was there room in all of this for God? The rapidly expanding Reformed Church of America sure thought so. There were a lot of Dutch dairymen in Southern California. So as a result of that, they wanted to start churches here in California to pastor the Dutch community. The Reformed Church needed a pastor who knew how to build a ministry. They took a chance on a 29-year-old preacher from Northern Illinois named Robert Schuler. He grew this tiny little church in Ivanhoe from 35 bickering people to over 500 within just a few years time. The denomination saw within him the potential to plant a church out here in the West Coast. He came here and was given two acres of land by the denomination, but he didn't have any facilities. It would take two years for the new church to be built. So the energetic pastor had to think outside the box. He put his possibility thinking into action and he gets out a little napkin right there in the restaurant where we were eating and he started jotting down all kinds of things that came to his mind. He started putting together a list of 10 possibilities that he might be able to hold the church services in. And that list included Seventh-day Adventist churches, mortuaries, schools. The list was filled with dead ends. The second to last idea on that napkin was a drive-in movie theater in Orange County. He went to the guy and he said, what do you think? Would you let me stand on top of the snack bar roof and just preach and have the cars come on Sunday? And the guy was so taken aback. <laughs> it's like, what is this? This is a crazy idea. There was no roof, no altar, no pews. Shula just jumped up on a snack bar and started preaching. My grandparents lived right next door <laughs> to that drive-in theater, and we used to go out and watch this preacher preaching from the roof of where we had bought popcorn <laughs> the night before. It was an inspired era for the American automobile. Chevy's iconic Bel Air, for instance, came out that year. Shula tapped into a cultural phenomenon. Dr. Schuler's church was a genius because it was during the car culture. Here in Southern California, people practically live in their cars. Reverend Schuler broadcast his message directly into the front seats through the drive-in speakers. There was a post at each place where a car was, and then you could take the speaker out and hang it on your car window. Don't toot your horn, but just smile at me through the windshield. I could hear his voice very clearly kind of echoing throughout that drive-in theater space. Two years later, Schuler's real church, a small 250-seat chapel, was finally ready. It was time to leave the drive-in. Well, maybe not. There was a lady who came to the drive-in whose name was Rosie Gray. And this was the only church she could go to. Rosie Gray was a paraplegic. Her devotion made a big impression on the young preacher. In the 50s, there was no such thing as accessibility. There was no ramps. I mean, it just didn't exist. Shula decided to keep the drive-in alive. But after years of bouncing between two churches, Shula was exhausted. My dad, meanwhile, is doing the service six miles away with the walk-in church, hauling the organ to the drive-in church, climbing on top of the snack bar rooftop, he said, I didn't come to plant two churches. <laughs> we have to somehow bring these two churches together as one. And so he really, really molded about it. And finally, he got this brainstorm, let's do a walk-in, drive-in church. Shula bought 10 acres in Garden Grove and built a 22,000 square foot pavilion with glass walls. It was all glass on the two sides, which allowed you to be inside the congregational area, sanctuary, and also look outside. The original Garden Grove Community Church was built to mimic a drive-in on the outside with the curve style and the ramps and the speakers. Between the cars and the pews, he built a 20-foot tall sliding glass door. It was a big part of the service for those doors to open because it was a way of saying to both congregations, we are one. 
That church, now known as the Arboretum, was a hit. Once the Arboretum was completed, then they were able to merge the two congregations. And when that happened, the church exploded. Shuler's popularity caught the attention of evangelist Billy Graham. Billy saw what he was doing here. And he was so impressed that he said, you know, you should put your church service on television. My father started looking at this and says, well, if this is what God wants me to do, I'll do it. Welcome to an hour of power. Shuler's televangelist ministry hit the airwaves in 1970. Once again, Shuler tapped into a cultural phenomenon. Sunday mornings were busy around here. When Dr. Shuler started televising his services, that's when TV started to take off as well. The Hour of Power became the most watched weekly religious program on TV. Life can be different. Life can be better. Life can be wonderful. But by the late 70s, the television ministry had outgrown its modest home in the Arboretum. Now we have problems to carry on that ministry. The problems we have, as you can see here, people are standing. Many people came to this church this morning and they left. People were standing in the aisles, the lawn is full, the drive-in is full, and with that he says, okay, I've got to build another facility. By now, the Reverend Shuler had rich taste and ambitious goals. To design his cathedral, he hired one of the hottest architects of the day, Philip Johnson. Philip was very interested in glass in this period of time, tinting it, cutting it, and the kind of reflectivities you'd get off of it, the darkness, the lightness, and he'd done a series of glass buildings. Johnson was most famous for his Connecticut home, known as the Glass House, which seemed to bring the outdoors inside. Reverend Shuler challenged Johnson to do that on a grand scale. Johnson came back with a design for a church with a sloping glass roof. I did an early design for Dr. Shuler. It wasn't any good. He came, he was so disappointed, he couldn't say a single word. All of the side walls were solid, and just the roof was glass. And my father looked at that and he goes, well, is there any way we can do the whole thing in glass? Johnson went back to the drawing board and returned with a revolutionary design. Two weeks later, I don't know where it came from, this design occurred to me in an extraordinarily short time. I could hardly believe it. But this is the best design I have ever done in my life. The central sanctuary would be a hexagon with a triangle on one side for the altar and a triangle on the other side for TV production and additional seating. The sloped roof and all of the walls would be covered in 10,000 panes of glass, making it the largest glass building on Earth. But could it actually be built? Robert Schuler prayed on it. It was as if God was speaking to him, and, and he says, okay, Lord, let's do it. 